not working. <laughs> no. Ah. Okay. <laughs> 19.3 million. That's how many patients there are diagnosed with cancer each year worldwide. And unfortunately, this number is increasing for years now. Within less than 20 years from now, this number is expected to be 28.4 million, an increase of almost 50%. Now currently, in Europe alone, 35,000 of these patients are children and adolescents. Luckily, there has been a remarkable progress in the development of anti-cancer treatments. And nowadays, about 80% of the patients will luckily survive. That's great news, right? Yes, but there is also a downside to the story. About two-thirds of the patients will have some late side effects in their lifetime due to the cancer treatment. And these side effects, they can be severe and really impact the daily life of these patients. Now, to better understand how these side effects occur, it's important to know how cancer is formed and how these anti-cancer therapies actually work. So this is a picture of what healthy tissue looks like. It's full of normal cells which are growing and dividing in a controlled way. Now at some point, an abnormal cancer cell can be formed. And this cancer cell can start to grow and divide in an uncontrolled way. And this, these cancer cells can start to multiply and form other cancer cells, which will also start to multiply and multiply. And before you know it, a tumor can be formed. The two most commonly used um, therapies to treat cancer are chemo and radiotherapy. Now, I, I will spare you from a long, boring scientific explanation, but what these therapies essentially do is they will try to destroy the cancer cells, thereby preventing their growth and spread until the tumor will shrink and hopefully eventually disappear. Hopefully it disappears. <laughs> However, the body is made up of many cell types, including healthy cells, which can naturally grow at a faster pace. The problem is that chemo and radiotherapy can't really differentiate between healthy, rapidly dividing cells and the rapidly dividing cancer cells. So for this reason, the cancer therapy can also harm or even kill healthy cells. And as you can imagine, this can cause some severe side effects. Some common side effects of the cancer treatment, which you've probably all heard of, are hair loss, nausea, or weakened immune system. But did you know that cancer treatment could also cause infertility? And when I tell you this, the key question arises. Can we do something to prevent these patients from becoming infertile? Well, for adults, the answer is quite simple. It's mostly, yes, we can. Because the patient will have the option to bank a semen sample containing mature sperm cells before he starts his treatment. And these mature sperm cells can then be frozen until the patient might need them later in his life. But what do we do for young boys? Well, for them it's more complicated because we cannot bank their mature sperm cells for the simple reason that, unlike adult patients, they just don't have mature sperm cells yet because they will only be produced from puberty onwards. So for a long time, the only option for young boys would be to make use of donor sperm or to go for adoption when they had a child wish later in their life. But as you can imagine, this is not an ideal situation for the patient. So what could we possibly do for these young boys who don't have mature sperm cells yet? Well, 
we could try to save their immature cells that can then later form the mature sperm cells. Now, in order to do this, we have to harvest these immature cells before the patient starts his treatment. And to do this, the patient will have to um, lose some testicular tissue. And to reassure all the boys in this room, I will not show you any pictures of how we take testicular tissue, but I will show you this figure instead. Um, so essentially, a small piece of testicular tissue up to a whole testicle can be removed for this procedure. Now, in the use at Brussels, we recommend about taking half of a testicle to make sure that we have enough tissue to help the patient later in his life. Because as you can imagine, when you have a really young boy, his testicles are probably still really small. So once we have this immature tissue, we cut it into really small fragments and we freeze it until the patient might need it later in his life. Now, since researchers came up with this idea, of testicular tissue banking, the first banking program was set up in 2002 at the UZ Brussels. And since then, many fertility centers around the world have also started to implement this in their fertility clinic. A survey of 2019 showed that tissue from more than 1,000 boys was already banked in the context of fertility preservation. However, up to this day, none of these tissues were already used to restore the fertility of a patient. Now, because taking testicular tissue is an invasive procedure, and because, as I said, these fertility restoration methods are not yet implemented in the clinic, we only include patients who are at high risk of becoming infertile for the banking program. So patients who have a risk of more than 80% of becoming infertile due to their cancer treatment. Now, besides this, although it seems to be a safe procedure, we are not quite sure of the long-term effects of the testicular tissue biopsy on the testicular function of the patients. And that's actually one of the things that we're currently studying in our lab, because we're following up patients who had childhood cancer treatment. So in the first part of the study that we're currently doing, we are following up young children who just had chemo or radiotherapy to treat their cancer and had the option to bank testicular tissue. So in these patients, we want to assess whether their pubertal development is normal or not. And we do this by taking a look throughout the years at their pubertal status their testicular volume, and we're also looking at their hormone levels. And these are hormone levels like, for example, testosterone, which are giving us a broader picture about the pubertal status of the patient. Besides this, we're also interested in the long-term effects on patients who are a little bit older. And in these patients, we want to check whether their fertility status is normal or not. So here we're also looking at the testicular volume and the hormone levels, but most importantly, we are doing a sperm analysis. And in this analysis, we will see whether the patient produces mature sperm cells or not. Another thing that we're researching in our lab currently are fertility restoration methods. And there are actually a couple of methods which you can use to restore the fertility of the patient. But the easiest method, which is also the closest to implementation in the clinic, is the testicular tissue transplantation method. So in a nutshell, what we do here is we take the immature frozen tissue, we thaw it, and we transplant it back into the adult testis. And this has already been successful in monkeys, and hopefully we can implement it in the clinic real soon. However, this method is not suitable for all patients because some patients, like for example, patients with leukemia, they might have some cancer cells left in their immature tissue. And of course, we do not want to transplant cancer cells back into a patient. So for them, an alternative would be to make use of stem cell transplantation. So what we do here is we take the immature cells, we isolate them from the tissue that we harvested, and we only transplant these cells back into the testis. Now, unfortunately, the isolation methods are not yet optimal these days, so we cannot guarantee that only the right cells are selected and that no cancer cells are left. 
Another option for these patients would be to go for in vitro spermatogenesis, meaning the formation of sperm cells outside of the body. So for this, we would take frozen tissue, we thaw it, and we let these cells mature in a culture until there are mature sperm cells. This method was already successful in mice, but not yet in a human. But this would be very cool, right? So I know this was a lot of information. Um, so to wrap things up, I have a few take home messages for you. And if you can already remember these, if I'm leaving, I will be a very happy, happy person today. So first of all, cancer treatment can cause male infertility. For adult men, it's quite easy. We can just bank their mature sperm cells. But for young boys, it is not an option because they just don't have mature sperm cells yet. So for them, the only option would be to bank testicular tissue. Although this is a very promising method, it is unfortunately still experimental up to this day. So therefore, we only include high-risk patients at the moment. The fertility restoration methods are also still under development, but hopefully we can implement them in the clinic real soon so that the worlds of cancer and infertility no longer have to meet. Thank you.